Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, we're on the verge of an anniversary for uh, a landmark moment in Canadian cinema, and it deserves to be uh, talked about, so why don't we do just that? And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and in a conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that you do. You can subscribe to the podcast. You can find us over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google. Give us that five-star rating and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In the Seats YouTube channel. So if you give us a like and subscribe there as well, we would absolutely appreciate it. Also, don't hesitate to follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram at either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, it's the most important thing. Please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large. Because if we love the... To watch it and write about it and talk about it. We love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please stop on by and pay us a visit. On this episode, oh, we got a special one. We got a good one. Uh, It's we're celebrating an anniversary, really. It is the 35th anniversary of uh, our own Patricia Rosima's landmark film which uh, debuted at Cannes and won awards and the whole nine yards. And it's uh, had a 4K restoration, and it's uh, playing a run at the Metrograph in New York on March 11th, and it's going to play the Alamo Draft House in L.A. on March 18th. It is I've Heard the Mermaids Singing, starring Sheila McCarthy. Uh, and like I said, this film did win the, the Prix de la Jeunesse back in '87. And it's it's a fantastic story. It's a, it's a charmer. It's a it's a little whimsical. It's about a daydreamer who has artistic aspirations. Uh, it's a character study that follows amateur photographer Polly, played brilliantly by Sheila McCarthy, as she lands a temp job at a Toronto art gallery run by uh, the elegant and sophisticated Gabrielle, uh, who is also a painter, and Polly becomes impressed with Gabrielle's paintings, but as Polly gets to know Gabrielle's lover, Mary, uh, and becomes entangled in their lives, she realizes that uh, Gabrielle isn't exactly who uh, she appears to be. Uh, With her spiky orange hair, Sheila McCarthy became almost a queer icon, and it's really a, a wonderful story, and it's it's almost she's almost elf like and it's really this this beautifully comic uh and really interesting tale about you know going for your art and going for your dreams i mean it's warm spirited but it, it's it's very representative at the same time and it's one of those films that has withstood the test of time it is a it is a brilliant piece of work and we had the distinct pleasure of sitting down and talking with writer director uh patricia rosma about uh about this anniversary of hers with this this landmark film and just sort of how she got it made and how it got started and uh, sort of the legacy of it where they're in and it's uh, we had a fascinating talk and uh, and I hope you enjoy it because I mean it was a good one and uh, if you're in New York or in Los Angeles in the next couple of weeks I do recommend getting out to see this again on the big screen and I know it's going to be touring <coughs> excuse me to select other cities uh, throughout spring, but uh, that's about it. You know, just enjoy our talk with Patricia Rosma as we sort of celebrate uh, the anniversary of I've Heard the Mermaid Singing and its beautiful 4K restoration. Uh, enjoy our talk with Patricia. It's a darn good one. All right, now, I mean, obviously, just to kick it off, I mean, happy anniversary, I guess would be the right word, because it's the 35th anniversary for mermaids. But, I mean, I'm always kind of curious. Um <laughs> What's that? It's the 35th. I hadn't actually even clocked that. It was just kind of 
uh, happenstance that we're re-releasing it now. I got the rights back. We, I happened to meet Brigitte Hubman, who is disseminating it around the world now. Kino Lorber got interested. We have screenings at Metrograph and now uh, 10 country, uh, 10 countries, 10 cities, and then movie picked it up. So, it, yeah, but I'm happy to know that it's 35. That makes it somehow more legitimate. <laughs> but I mean, that, that kind of, that's the first question I kind of want to ask because I mean, Obviously, we always hear stories of, you know, you know, 4K restoration of such and such, touring print, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm always curious how the ball starts. Like, do they call you? Do you call them? But I mean, obviously, you said you got the rights back. So I guess maybe that was the first step on this journey. Well, I had the rights. I got rights back from a couple of other ones. I've always had this idea that at some point there would be kind of a revisiting of old work because, um, I mean, I knew I was an oddity in my day. Right. I knew that there were very few female filmmakers. There was almost nobody doing queer material. And um, and I knew even just this style and my own voice was its own um, unusualness. So uh, I but I had this feeling that um, please, if you don't mind me sounding spectacular particularly arrogant, I suppose, but that the world would catch up um, <laughs> and maybe there would be some interest later. Um, that, that is spectacular arrogant. But I just, I do feel like because I came from such a uh, unusual background, I was my own unicorn, I suppose. And um, uh, I just thought that maybe there would be interest in, okay, there's so few women speaking right now, so few uh, queer filmmakers, speaking right now uh maybe historically it would have some interest later no i mean i think you're so, so anyway i always had the idea and then yeah the stars aligned at this moment you know they the uh tiff did that re refurbishment of the print a few years ago and that was fantastic so i had a nice fresh new print to work with and then the other rights came back to me and i met the right person to be able to get the work out so so now it's actually mermaids is just the beginning and then they'll uh, all my other stuff is coming out later in a retrospective later well fantastic so, i can't wait to see that yeah some really unusual ones actually they're 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 interesting to me <laughs> anyway which isn't, isn't saying much but um they're interesting because uh they're not as um you know mermaids was my hit single in a way right the, I mean, the <laughs> first sure. one out of out of the box and and it uh it, it was the sort of the warmest and the e easiest uh and the most di digestible and other things were a little bit more um had more edges and, and and sharp angles on it so um there's some other more complicated things that no i mean i i, I got to revisit it the other day and there's a shot in the film that i had completely forgotten about but i think it really does encapsulate almost the entire story it's just it's Sheila in the restaurant with her leg sticking all the way through the table. I mean, that is such a genius shot. And I mean, can you talk to me a little bit just, just to go back about, I mean, trying to find Sheila, but also just composing that shot because it's so simple, but it really is so genius. It's so it so encapsulates the entire story all at the same time. Oh, thank you for saying that. You're actually, uh, you know, you're with, with, with making that statement you're embracing a theory I have which is that every shot is a microcosm of the macrocosm and every scene is a you know a little slightly larger microcosm in that each element has to fit into the whole in order for it to have a kind of a really unified sure. tone and impact and have its own signature style um yeah I loved it I loved how flat on it was it was just formal and you know I and and uh, her her white sandals sticking out the other end were so perfect, and you know just not knowing what to do with herself physically, not knowing the rules, not knowing the social expectations, not having a sense of what's awkward or what's beautiful. She's just there, and this was her most comfortable. E even the way she sort of pushes herself in to shove the sure. other chair away, kind of to try to try to make the, the sense of this 
oddness. Um, yeah, her complete lack of sophistication and self-consciousness uh, was what made me love her anyway, as a character. Um, what, how would you describe it? Like, how, how do you see it as a microcosm? You know, honestly, I think, like I said, just sort of the endearing nature of the character and trying to find herself sort of in the world where her place is and where to where she fits in. It really is this sort of beautiful tableau of sort of being awkward. And like, if there's any way to visually represent awkwardness, I think this really does it quite well. I love awkwardness. I love it as a source of humor. Like a lot of the comedians I love, they just, they trade on that. I think it's just a profound motivator in, in, in humans. Like it makes you change color, mm. right? If, if embarrassment makes you turn another color, how, how physically uh um you know uh dominating is 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 something like that in our psyches that that we are actually physically will 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 transform interior and exterior you know presentation of ourselves um i and i feel like we all live in dread of of embarrassment and of humiliation and of losing our dignity and i mean i i can remember when i after i've made i've heard the mermaid singing i was seeing someone in Paris and she would go away for a few days a week to teach in the south and I and I was alone and I would have to and I, my French was terrible at the time have to go out and get food and I realized that I would go up to a place and I think oh I can't stand being humiliated by these Parisian fantastic people and I would like go hungry rather than be humiliated by by French you know sandwich makers um so that i thought that is my my need for survival is actually less than my need for dignity um so anyway i'm i'm very um i'm drawn to awkwardness and humiliation as a source of humor because i think there's something it's a it's a it's a profound driver in the in the in our collective psyche no you're absolutely right and i mean it's it's one of those things that does drive us and it is sort of it's a motivator and i mean I'm I'm fascinated too by the fact that I mean you mentioned this was like your quote unquote hit single, but in many ways this was also that for Sheila as well. How was how in retrospect how has it been sort of sharing that as well? Because I got to imagine it's it was a it was a mutually shared experience to sort of have Mermaids be the success that it was. We had so much fun with it. We couldn't believe it. We're I come from a very uh, Calvinist background, right? And and as I get older, I understand its impact on me artistically and personally more and more um but at the time when I was making this film I kept thinking don't do this to get famous don't do this to get popular don't do this like even how does how does anyone come up with this don't do this to get seen it's not about getting it seen it's like what a movie is not about getting seen um but make it something pure make it something that if a few friends of yours see it in your basement, you are proud, it makes them laugh and it makes them think and it, and it moves them. That's, that has to be your motivation, which I still do think that that should, if that leads, then you're more likely to stay true to something, you know, but I was so um, fixated. And then I, after I had a few screenings, people would laugh and people would like, you know, I could tell in their voices and their emotions that 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 this was having some kind of impact. So I um, started to think, wow, what if this is actually really a success? And then I dared. I found a form for the Cannes Film Festival and I sent it in. My producer Alex Raffi and I sent it in secretly and thought nobody needs to know that we applied if they reject us. And then they wanted it and. You know, then suddenly we're scrambling to get a 35 mil print because they won't show anything but 35, but we don't have the money and the whole system isn't set up to give us that money. Anyway, we, Jan Rolfkamp gave us the money to, to, to blow it up, fortunately, because we couldn't get it together in time and suddenly we're there, you know, uh, Sheila and I and, you know, co-producer Alex and um, we're strolling on the Quasette and we're being like, you know, there's a bidding war and suddenly it's sold to 40 countries and we're rich <laughs> it's like it's it's a it's making money for the canadian government which is unheard of and it's 
Um, and Sheila is the belle of the ball, as she totally deserves to be her. I, I always thought of her as Buster Keaton, because she's just yeah. got such a sort of forlorn, she never smiles in the whole movie. She's got impeccable comic chops, right? She's just so good on every little comedic moment. You're like, I couldn't have found better. Um, and we just, yeah, we were, we just, did a, we thrilled in it. We just enjoyed the whole ride. It was one of those, can you believe this? And why isn't everyone doing this? And you didn't, you know, you don't realize when it's your first one out of the gate, that how, how, how rare an event this is, you know? Well, and I mean, it's one of those things that, I mean, looking back on it now, it really does feel like one of those outliers, especially in Canadian cinema that managed to sort of find a place on the global stage but it wasn't trying to be overtly Canadian. I mean, something that we as Canadians have fallen into that trap every now and again, just trying to sort of advertise our Canadianness. How do you think, looking yeah, back... Yeah, well, certainly that, wasn't writing it. Oh, I'm sorry, finish your sentence. No, how do you think the film has aged just sort of overall in terms of, not just on the Canadian landscape, but on the sort of world landscape? Well, if I can just address the not trying to be Canadian, but it also wasn't hiding it. It was very rare to have someone in a key moment yes. with a toque with a Canadian flag on the front and in her home there's the old CN Tower sitting there it's like there was I felt like there was something um fresh about its frankness I agree um uh, uh, of its Canadianness. it wasn't selling it but I but I did I I you know, I had this belief from somewhere that um, it, it, you know, a, 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 a anything of uh, any um, complexity needs to ring true on a personal, first pers just me personal level, but then on a social level, and then a, a political level. And I sort of saw her as a bit of a stand-in for Canada, you know, mm -hmm. not the bell of the ball, not the, you know, the one that everyone rushes to for uh their power and their global dominance, you know, um, sometimes uh, considered, especially then, you know, now we've got status the world, um, uh, especially then, I think we were just thinking it was like, the, you know, the, the quiet, slightly awkward other cousin, you know, yeah. um, so I, uh, I, 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 I it, it was part of the message of the movie to sort of um, explore the psyche of that. Um, on, on different levels. How's it aged? Oh, I'm Dave, you can tell me that better than I can. Um, I've been actually, Adam Goyan was just over for, for a, a coffee this morning and I said, I'm, I'm looking at this thing as, you know, I know what my intentions were. I know what I was thinking and feeling then. Does it mean anything now? Like, what does it mean now? Um, and, you know, it's fun to see the 80s shoulder pads and to um, look at those hairdos and chuckle a little bit. And I think the um, ideas of, you know, artistic authenticity and daring to do things purely because you feel them and that every human has a, a right to voice these things. Not, you know, no, one, not, not, no one's going to watch every human's um, voicing, but uh, every human has a right to, to to, to, to speak uh, their own experience in, in another form, which is what art is. Um, so, and, and the, I think part of its uh, acceptance at the time was, A, it was funny, you know, yeah. and Sheila was so damn funny. So like, you can't, like, if you can make people laugh, you can take them anywhere, right? That's sure. like, that's a, um, and I, when I wrote it, I thought it was sort of quietly amusing and a little absurd. And uh, I, I loved the sort of magic realism. And I, and I was deliberately wanting to be light in it because I wanted to, you know, give, bring the homosexuality into it. And, you know, my Calvinist self-loathing, you know, didn't think I could just be frank about that. I actually took my cue from... My beautiful laundrette. I was watching that, which came out a couple of years before I made this, and I thought, "Oh, introduce the characters, get invested in their agenda and their issues and their environment, and then have the guy kiss the guy." You know, like yeah. then actually bring in their their the thing that's more difficult for most audiences. I mean, this is 1987. This is this is there wasn't much out there except for a lot of tragic homos like slitting their own throats you know for the 
that's sort of the pleasure of everybody else. Um, I uh, so that is how does it stand up? I think I don't know. I mean, I've watched it a little while ago with an uh, with an audience. I had the um, great joy to show it to my eighteen year old who just turned eighteen. It looks like eighty one on your screen, but it's oh, eighteen. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, and there, a young artist, and um, I said, "What is it like uh, from stage?" I took the risk, a bit shy, and I said, "What uh, what do you what does it say to you?" And and they said, um, "It makes me feel more confident about being an artist." I thought. Well, that's enough right there. If that's like all that, that movie did. I like that, yeah. No, I mean, it really is, a, at least to me, a testament to the importance of staying true to the artistic vision. Because, I mean, especially now these days, we live in such a day and age where people can use art for a soapbox or people can use art to make a statement or they can use it as pure commerce and go the other way. There's okay with doing something in the middle and letting story rise to the top, which is what I think this film really beautifully does and just to start putting a bow on this this is something i always like to ask people it's silly but i've got to do it because i know you started off as a journalist and then you worked with david for a little bit then you made mermaids like was this all was filmmaking always in the cards for you like what and i'm curious like what were the films that made you want to be a storyteller well the first films that i saw were <laughs> bergman um persona and face-to-face -face double bill i saw that Fantastic. in grand Rapids, michigan at the bijou theater when i was studying philosophy at calvin college and i went with my boyfriend at the time and uh i thought this is a different way of thinking and feeling and talking and experiencing this like just music and image and like a kind of a poetic logic not a not a you know chase them punch them not a yuck yuck all the way through not like that it will to um sort of just Maybe, maybe because I had such a religious upbringing, maybe it appealed to something um, more scriptural in me. But um, but then I can't help it. Like even if I don't even think I'm making a comedy, then it ends up being kind of <laughs> absurd. So I think like I never would have expected this to end up in comedy racks in the video right. store at the right. time, which no longer exists. <laughs> but but you know, partly Sh Sheila was so good at that stuff and. Um, I think Doug Coe, who was shooting it, has such a natural gift for, for comedy and making an image funny. Yeah. And I just leaned into that, into the, into the, into the humor of it. But um, yeah, what made me think, I, I think it was a, it was a calm, it was a kind of a prismatic influence. I love music. I knew that music is the art to inspire. And, and I loved, um, uh, uh, just, just image. I used to draw a lot and I paint now. And, um, I, um, and then, you know, theater and then through journalism, I discovered the power of the image and how much, and I, I actually thought I would write stories. That's what I thought I would do. I would write and that I'd have to have a job, a paying job on the side. I'm sure of that. I'd have to pay because I didn't know any artists. I didn't know anybody. I came, grew up in a family of business people and who were farmers before. So I, have any I asked my grandmother were there any artists in the family and she thought about it she said, no no they were all normal you know <laughs> <laughs> um so I had no history of that but um I think when you you uh so so it no it came together through a series of influences and uh, thank god and I also I was just an outlier at, at, like I was just at the right moment in Canada where money was coming through for features, right? Mm. And there were a few people, Wayne Clarkson and Bill House and Linda Beeth and uh, like Sir, Sir Peter Pearson, uh, like people who were uh, wanted to give money to fiction at the time. And um, it wasn't, and there was a kind of a critical community that was ready to support it too. John Harkness at now as prickly as he was, but um, and Jay Scott, amazing critic that we lost way too young. Um, so these people allowed for uh, a, 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 a new fiction voice that was quite, um, um, you know, alternative to a mainstream type of storytelling to come forward. And Adam McGoyan came forward and Bruce McDonald and Don McKellar and, you know, the boys and me. <laughs> Well, I mean, just thank you for your fiction voice and thank you for contributing this small part into our sort of film mosaic that is Canadian film, which 
I try to support every damn day just because it's it's the job and it's what I love to do. I know you do. And that is so, it's so important, you know, like me just making my own things with nobody talking about it is, 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 is useless and, and, and un, unseen. So I really, really appreciate your, your support, Dave. It's, it means a lot. Really well, I know, I, I know this print's going to New York and LA and I'm sure it's going to hit the light box sooner rather than later, but again, thank you so much for the time. And again, happy anniversary. Congratulations on the work and keep doing the good work. Thank you. Can I just tell you that Lori Anderson is going to be doing a chat with me at the Metrograph in, uh, in New York. Oh, that's and wild. that's a kind of, an incredible, like, uh, confluence of, of um, things. Because, like, I was listening to Oh Superman at the time, and I was mesmerized by, by her. And then we both had our features at the director's fortnight in Cannes at the same time. And that's where I met her the first time, because um, she had Home of the Brave. Um, yeah. At, at, at in in at, at director's fortnight in Cannes, and um and then we've sort of stayed in touch over the years, and now she's inter not interviewing, but we're going to do a chat after the screening in in New York. Um, anyway, there's a there's a lot of other sort of Margaret Atwood has a beautiful essay in her new book, uh, Burning Burning Questions about it's called Big Science. I, I encourage people to read it about Laurie. So anyway, so fun, so fun. You're so making nice. me wish I was in New York, but again, come, you know. <laughs> come, man. it's like a flight. It's flight. The world is open again. Come. Th thank you so much for the time, Patricia. I really appreciate right. it. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and and Blu-ray needs.